Hello everybody, buenos días a todos. Eh, les doy la bienvenida a esta sesión de la Comisión de Arbitraje de la Barra Mexicana Colegio de Abogados. I welcome everybody to this session of the Mexican Arbitration Committee of the Mexican Bar Association. Uh, I will continue in English in, in, for, for, because of the language our speaker is going to be speaking in. And I know everybody here is fluent in English. Uh, on behalf of the Mexican Bar uh, Arbitration Committee, we welcome you all. Thank you for being on time. Um, we're very excited to have today Toby Lando with us. Toby uh, is, a, it's a cliche to say somebody needs no introduction, but in, in Toby's case, that is actually true. Toby is a barrister, a QC, uh, originally based from England, who studied also in Harvard, and who's currently speaking to us from Pakistan and is based usually in Singapore. And he's one of those persons, few persons in the world, who's really entirely no, uh, worldwide known. Uh, I personally think he's one of the most important pr practitioners in the world. And the fact that he's with us today and he took his, the time from his busy schedules to talk to us about such a salient topic is, is, is a reason for all of us to be thankful to you, Toby. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, if Folks, don't mind. We will welcome questions at the end. Toby will be speaking for 45 minutes or so. And the topic is very interesting. So I think many of us will have questions. And I suggest we keep them for the end. And one final remark. We would very much appreciate if um, you were all muted while the presentation takes place to avoid echoes. Toby, this is your forum. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a great, great pleasure to join you all. Uh, I'm deeply embarrassed by that introduction. But uh, if I could have that introduction on a daily basis, that would certainly brighten, brighten life. Thank you very much for that. Um, I am going to address you as a common lawyer trained uh, on the problems with the common law. Uh, this is a, um, uh, a topic which makes me deeply unpopular with many of my colleagues, especially uh, QCs in London, whose bread and butter in their practice is cross-examining witnesses. Uh, and so um, this is uh, something of a uh, controversial uh, issue, um, but of something, something of great significance for the practice of international arbitration. I think as, as everybody here will be well aware, the way that we practice international arbitration is increasingly characterized by what might be called procedural habits. There's a set standardized model that we all now use. And we all have that in mind when we prepare our cases. It is a mixture, an attempt to harmonize aspects of the common law system and aspects of the civil law system. And it's something that we are all proud of in the world of international arbitration because it's a unified model uh, that everybody can understand. It bridges geographical divisions and it means that we know what to expect. Uh, and there's no particular premium, supposedly, if you are a common lawyer or you are a civil lawyer. The thumbnail sketch of it, actually, sorry, before I say that, I should say this is something that started in commercial arbitration, but it has bled into investor state arbitration. And it is essentially, at its core, a Anglo-US litigation model. Um, with civil law aspects attached to it. Uh, it. It's unclear why this now applies in investor state arbitration, and perhaps more significantly, why we've allowed it to, because it's full of so many problems. But be that as it may, that is the common assumption uh, that we uh, practice upon. That common model has at its core the adversarial notion that the tribunal is neutral and takes a completely passive stand in, um, in monitoring the, the process. So the parties are arranged in opposing interested, part, uh, interested groups, and they fight in front of a detached tribunal. That is, that's the core of the adversarial model. The, the actual model says that the tribunal doesn't need to take any active or proactive steps until the end of that process. It sits as a kind of Olympian neutral uh, umpire, and it watches the fight in front of it, gives the occasional direction, and then towards the end, it will start to weigh in and give its understanding of the process. This is a system which was uh, famously described by F.A. Mann 
one of the great jurists of the common law world, civil law as well, as the principle of unpreparedness. That is that you don't expect the judge or the arbitrator to be particularly prepared because you're gonna educate them. And the way we educate them is through a written phase, an oral phase and a written phase. So we start with all encompassing memorials uh, and then we have document production, we have witness statements, expert reports. There's a huge bulk that's presented to the tribunal in terms of information. We then repeat all that orally at the hearing and we go through an extensive process of witness examination. And then afterwards we have post-hearing briefs and more writing. Now, what I'm gonna focus on in my time is, that, is the witness element of that standard procedural model, uh, which is really a key attribute of the common law system. There are now in the modern practice of international arbitration, three truths, three things that generally apply. Firstly, witness testimony dominates most arbitration hearings. If you stand back and consider what is taking most time and what is taking up most cost in the procedure itself, it's generally the preparation and presentation of witness evidence, both in commercial arbitration and investor state. It's a lengthy, cumbersome, expensive process. In part, it's also unthinking, it's automatic. We all go on autopilot. When procedural order number one is issued by a tribunal, it will have standard directions generally for, for the treatment of witnesses without any particular regard to the particular needs of the dispute in front of the tribunal. And procedural order number one tends to have boilerplate standard provisions. And also in part, the process has become weaponized because witness statements and witness evidence is not really about evidence anymore. It's about arguing the case. Uh, and I'm gonna say a little bit more about that uh, in a minute. But what that means is that that standard process tends to give rise to pretty lengthy witness statements that have to be unpacked by pretty lengthy cross-examination at a hearing. The third, uh, the, um, the uh, actually, actually, I said there were three truths. The first truth is it dominates, dominates the process. The second truth is that it's become automatic, as I've just said. And the third truth is that although in some cases this process is useful, there are cases where you need to have witness testimony and you need to have cross-examination and there's no other way around it. In many cases, there is a fundamental mismatch between what is done in the hearing and what matters in the deliberation room amongst the tribunal when they're actually coming to their decision. Uh, I've had cases, you probably all have had them as well, where there are no documents. Uh, I had a case a few years ago involving a very substantial arms deal that was concluded by two gentlemen whilst they were treading water in the deep end of a swimming pool. Uh, there were no documents. So of course, you're gonna have to have witness testimony and you're gonna have to cross-examine. But those are pretty rare cases. Equally, it's pretty rare that a case turns on cross-examination, actually. So what you often get is a long process, takes a lot of time, costs a lot of money, and then the, tri the tribunal is sitting there and they're, and they're not showing any expressions on their faces because they don't wanna be accused of bias or prejudging. And then they stand up and they go back to the deliberation room and they say to each other, what was the point of that? How are we assisted by that, uh, et cetera. So that essential mismatch puts a, a spotlight on why we are spending so much time and so much money on the witness preparation and examination process, when in the end it may well have really very little impact uh, on, the, on the process. There are four troublesome spots, which I'm gonna highlight in this standardized model, which, which is incredibly useful, I think, for everybody to have on board and to think about, because these are troublesome spots that tend to play on the minds of arbitrators. They worry arbitrators. Uh, and it's something that arbitrators, these are points that arbitrators actually have the ability to deal with and grapple with, but they rarely do. And as counsel, we have the ability to think freshly about these trouble spots and, and actually change the way that we conduct ourselves 
in arbitration in order to maximize the value and the effectiveness of our witness evidence. So the first trouble spot in this model is actually the initial selecting of witnesses. That is, who is going to testify in front of the tribunal in the first place? In theory, the common law system says that you select witnesses and present, present them on the basis of who is best able to provide evidence. So who was most closely affected, most closely involved, who can actually speak to the facts in question? I can tell you from a common law perspective, and this will be no surprise to anybody on this, uh, on, on this session, that's not what happens. The selection process is, a, is an area of strategy. Any sensible lawyer is not going to select witnesses actually who are just on the basis of who is best placed to testify. On the contrary, you will select witnesses on the basis of who is going to be most presentable to the tribunal, who is going to be most persuasive, most attractive, and importantly, who can speak well, and who is going to be most resilient to cross-examination. Your best witness may be somebody who, who cannot be cross-examined because they keep agreeing to everything that's put to them, or they're not eloquent, or they give a bad impression. So tactically, there's nothing in the common law system that says that you must actually present that person. You don't. You tend to present somebody who is going to be best able to play the system for what it is. And, and that means actually that very often in these cases, tribunals get the impression they're not actually hearing from the people that they should hear from. There are people who are absent. And the problem that we're faced with in our system is that we don't actually have many tools at our disposal to deal with this. Uh, one, one tool might be drawing an adverse inference because somebody has not been presented, but that's a very blunt tool. It doesn't actually help you in the detail of finding facts. Um, you could just rely upon the burden of proof and say, well, somebody hasn't proven their case. Again, that doesn't help with detailed factual findings. Uh, and actually in one particular area, it's of no assistance at all. And that's an investor state arbitration where the stakes can be extremely high and there are issues about legitimacy of the process. You can't really make a robust award in an investor state case, which isn't gonna be attacked by interest groups later on the basis of adverse inferences if key people have not been presented. So although tribunals in the common law system have long had the power themselves to call witnesses, you find uh, in, in most practice, tribunals are reluctant to do it. It's actually pretty rare across international practice that a tribunal will insist upon somebody being presented. So that is the first uh, area of difficulty with our common, our common system. It's an area that tribunals are able to deal with if they were to have the courage to do so. And it's an area that us as council can actually foreshadow uh, by the way that we select our witnesses and the way that we coordinate with the tribunal uh, in order to actually present the best people. The second area is, is much more problematic, and that is witness proofing and witness statements. This is, of course, a well-worn area of practice. And it's the subject of the 2020 ICC Commission Task Force on maximizing evidence of witnesses. I don't know how many people on, on this call are familiar with that report? It's a very, very worthwhile report to look at, um, 2020 ICC Task Force. It, um, it raises key points, comes to some interesting conclusions, not all of them um, determinative, lots of different options. There's also another document that I would highly recommend to you, which curiously comes from the English courts. There was a practice direction issued in the London Commercial Court around about the same time in 2020. It maybe came out a bit later, actually, as the ICC task force. Uh, I, I can send it to Francisco and it can be circulated. Practice direction 57AC. And what it does is it, it attacks basically and reconsiders, reconceptualizes what witness statements should be 
before the English court. It's incredibly interesting because the English court is the home of the witness statement. It's where it all came from originally. And it's the English court now turning around for court practice saying witness statements are problematic and they need to be redone. And that's something that actually us as international arbitrators or arbitration specialists can learn from. Uh, in fact, we must learn from, I, I think, because we are running a system that's, that's fundamentally flawed. When you look at the genesis of witness statements, the idea of them was to replace direct testimony. So the idea was to provide an efficient, orderly, fair way for a witness to present his or her evidence and to avoid the problem of surprises or ambushes for the opposing party. But we all know that that's not what happens now. Witness statements are an advocacy tool. They are extensive. They tend to be very, very lengthy. They are heavily overly lawyered, i.e. they're written by lawyers, obviously. They're not written by witnesses. They are packed with submissions. Uh, tellingly, they're often written in the same font as the memorial or the written legal submissions with the same law firm reference in the bottom left hand or right hand corner. Uh, they have perfect grammar. Even if the witness can't string a sentence together, the witness in the witness statement will be using liberally words such as aforementioned, thereto, possibly citing a statute or a case. Uh, and then when the witness is on the stand, it's pretty obvious that they have no, uh, no understanding at all of what they have actually written. And also witness statements are packed with things which are not evidence, narration of documents, a narration of other evidence. It makes them very, very lengthy and cumbersome. But also what happens is it raises the ante because if you put in an overly lawyered, overly worked statement, you are putting a burden on the other lawyer, the other side to cross-examine because it needs unpacking. So the more you lawyer the statement, the more you increase the length and the necessity of cross-examination. It's a ridiculous system. We're building in more time and more cost simply because we're not controlling the process itself. This is something that um, ha has been the focus of the commercial court practice direction that, I, that I've just mentioned. The, the second basic problem with what we do with witnesses, which is the focus of the ICC task force report, is um, we, have, we, we proceed without any understanding of the working of human memory. So we pretend that in putting together witness evidence, that's proofing witnesses and preparing witness statements and then cross-examining witnesses, we're uh, eliciting recollections of what happened in the past. Anybody with any knowledge about how the human brain works will know this has no scientific value whatsoever. On the contrary, we have come up collectively with a system which is almost guaranteed to corrupt recollections, to corrupt memory. So the process itself is actually actively undermining the value of the evidence that is being presented. Uh, just with a few minutes, I know it's early morning there, I'm gonna get scientific and technical and just go take you on a whistle stop tour of how your memory works. This may be familiar to some, but actually it's fascinating. It's something which I had done a, a big study on um, way back in 2010 and gave a lecture on. And in fact, it was the genesis of the, of the ICC Commission report itself. We, we think of memory as a recording device. Uh, that is that uh, it's, it's like a tape, tape recorder, video recorder. And that is a basic fallacy. Memory is not a single organ. It's not like a heart or a liver, uh, and it's not a single function with a stop and playback button. It's actually a dynamic process of construction. Um, and it's fragile and it's delicate and it's inherently unreliable. And very, very briefly, the best way to understand it is to break it down into three stages. There's a stage of acquisition of information. That's where we actually perceive things. Uh, and then there's a stage of storage or encoding and retention. That's when we put it in our brain. 
And then thirdly, there's a process of retrieval, which is the most important for arbitration. That is when somebody's asking you to get the information and articulate it. Each of those three stages is open to corruption, can be easily tainted. And there's a lot of scientific work to show how that happens. I'm not gonna um, bore you all now with all the detail. I'm just gonna give you some very, very, um, very, very um, short examples. So just going step by step, on the acquisition perception stage, um, acquisition of course depends on the quality and quantity of sensory, your sensory experience. But our misunderstanding is that we don't actually acquire information passively, we acquire it actively. That means when we perceive something, it's actually a process of construction that goes on. We are understanding actively the world around us. It's highly subjective and it's infused with stereotypes and assumptions about what we're actually seeing. So that means that um, what we see and what we perceive, of course, is inherently unreliable. I'm not gonna say any more about that because there isn't time. Where it gets more interesting is the second stage and that's storage. Uh, we don't store our memories in one place in our brain. The fascinating science here is that when you actually have information going into your head, you disassemble it into different components. Different little elements of one memory get stored in different parts of the brain for long-term memory. Um, and that is a, an amazing process. It actually, there, what science has now shown is that there are about 20 different categories that, they, that have, have been proven that get broken out and put in a different bit of your brain. Fruits and vegetables, would you believe, are stored in a different place in your brain from plants or animals or body parts or colors, numbers, letters, nouns, verbs, uh, facial expressions, various emotions go to different physical parts of your brain. The important thing about this is that when you actually come to recollect something, you are reassembling all those components. So it's actually an active process of construction. If you, if you remember a walk in the park, you will be uh, actually, your brain will be racing around and taking all different aspects of that walk and putting it together. And then you will articulate it. But in that process, there are all sorts of things that can go wrong uh, because other information is corrupting. The other information can come from many different areas, many different sources. The other information can come from yourself. So I'll give you one very quick example of this. Uh, there is something called a schema, which is a fact pattern that is repeated frequently and has become very, very familiar to you. It could be attending a board meeting. It could be driving to work in the morning. If you've got schemas in your head, that limits the, the way in which you organize information because anything that falls into your schema you will assume will, will follow a normal path. So when you come to recollect a board meeting, you might not actually be reassembling what happened at a particular board meeting. Instead, you're reassembling what normally happens at a board meeting. So it's a prediction of what normally takes place rather than what actually took place. And that means that your memory when it comes out is not actually accurate. It's full of what you think should have happened. That's one example of how there can be a corruption. But when we then move, lastly, to the third section, which is reassembly itself, so that's recollection. What's fascinating about the science is how the corruption can come not from just yourself, but from lawyers, from outside influences. Because the way that you respond to a question about your memory uh, depends on how the question is phrased. There are things in the question that can corrupt this process of reassembly. Uh, the best example, there are many of them, is a study done uh, by Loftus and Palmer back in the 1970s. Very, very famous study. Um, <coughs> just quickly, I'll quickly summarize it. It gives you a flavor of the science here. Group of, group of people are shown a video of a car crash. Afterwards, they're divided up into different groups. Each group is asked the same question, 
except that there's a little variation in that question for each group. And the question is, how fast was the white car going when it hit the black car? That's the question. <coughs> Excuse me. So that question is then varied by saying to one group, how fast was the white car going when it hit the black car? Next group, how fast was the white car going when it smashed into the black car? Next group, how fast was the white car going when it made contact with the black car? Now, each of those questions has a different verb, and the verb is implying a different speed. People give an answer, and that answer, then they're asked again a week later when a memory has gone into their head and they're then recollecting something. And there is a direct correlation between the verb and the speed. People who were asked smashed will say a higher speed than people who were asked made contact with. Now, the key point here, which is critical, this is not about honesty. It's not about a witness lying. It's not truth. It's about, they are honestly recollecting. It's about the inherent unreliability of the recollection process. Now, if you put that into our process of examining witnesses, uh, you can see exactly the problem. The minute you say to a witness something, you may well suggest something to them which will then form a component in their head, which every time they reassemble that memory becomes part of their genuine recollection. That can come from showing them a document, can come from just suggesting something to them, can come from any, any particular um, source. The other dynamic here is that it's possible to increase a witness's confidence in the, in the truth of their recollection, the, the accuracy of the recollection, simply by asking them a number of times. The more that people reassemble a memory and articulate it, the more confident they become that it's true. So if you're asking a witness a number of times, did this happen? Every time they may become more and more certain it did happen. Which means that by the time they get to the hearing, they are saying with absolute categorical certainty that this happened at a board meeting. But unless the tribunal knows the science, unless that process has been done incredibly carefully, that recollection could actually be really a very limited value as a matter of evidence. I, I've just given you um, just really, really sort of snapshot into the, uh, into the in incredible range of science that we now have. Um, it actually shakes one's confidence in, in many memories that we have. And that just to make, make things more complicated for everyone, this even applies to what are called flashbulb memories. A flashbulb memory is something shocking. So, you know, the question is, where were you when JFK was assassinated? Where were you on 9-11? And you'll know that. You'll say, well, I was at this particular point and I saw on TV the airplanes colliding uh, with the Twin Towers in New York. But the evidence shows that even a flashbulb memory like that is vulnerable to corruption. Uh, I just tell you very quickly because it's a it's a very it's a very amusing uh, story. One of the leading um, uh, um, scholars, scientists in this area, is a guy called Ulrich Nisa. I think he's at Columbia University, and he's he's done a lot of work on memory uh, memories um, fallibility. The reason is because. When he was a child, uh, he sat, he had a memory, a very vivid memory of sitting on his father's knee, listening to the radio in America and listening to a commentary of a baseball game. And in the middle of the baseball game, it, there was an interruption. A very stern voice came over the radio and announced the bombing of Pearl Harbor and everything changed for Ulrich Nisa and his family. Um, the world changed in that instant. And he told that story for many years up until the point that he suddenly realized that professional baseball is not played in December. This was a memory that couldn't have happened. It was so vivid and yet something had corrupted it. And, and that was like a, an example of something that had crept in 
Uh, and he had, because he had re-articulated that memory so many times, he was absolutely positive. He was certain. It's not to say that he didn't know, he, he wasn't listening to a commentary on the radio when Pearl Harbor was announced, but the details were wrong. And so again, that takes us to a problem with our witness uh, process in terms of scientific value. So if we go back to consider our model, we are running a model which is almost, as I said, guaranteed to cause this kind of corruption. I've, I've spoken about selection of witnesses. I've spoken about witness statements. Um, witness preparation is the third area of great difficulty. And the problem with witness preparation is that there's a huge gulf uh, between different legal traditions as to what you're allowed to do to your witness to prepare them before the hearing. And that means you get an imbalance in our system. You may have some cases where you've got US attorneys who have put their witnesses through a full dress rehearsal for the hearing. Uh, I've been asked previously to do that, to be part, part of a, a, a full dress rehearsal, to be a dummy arbitrator and run a full hearing uh, so that witnesses can be tested out as to how good they're gonna be. Going back to the science, there can't be anything worse in terms of preserving a memory uh, than doing something like that. And then on the other side, you may have civil lawyers, and you'll all be able to tell me much more about this, who are not accustomed at all to preparing their witnesses. I sat as an arbitrator in a Netherlands arbitration case some years ago, where it was run on domestic Netherlands procedure. In fact, I was the only one in the room who didn't speak Dutch. My Dutch got better by the end of the hearing. <laughs> what was amazing was that the first time that anybody met a witness was when the witness came in the room and the, and the examination was conducted by the tribunal. Now that may be customary uh, in your systems. It's not, the, it's not the international model, but it was incredibly refreshing to actually see witnesses who had not been, if I can put it this way, cooked. As a tribunal, you know when, you're, when witnesses have been cooked, but, you, but, you, but that's with experience. Not everybody can tell. All right, so you get the case, which is obvious. A counsel says to the witness, um, what, what date did you leave your employment? And the witness says, there are three reasons why I left my employment. That's obvious cooking. They're obviously prepared, but it's much more subtle than that in general practice. And you need to have a tribunal that's, that's confident to be able to detect the preparation and then able to take it into account when they're assessing the probity of the evidence. The fourth area of difficulty is actually the cross-examination process itself. And I think this is by way of a kind of top tip as to, as to a skepticism that's creeping into the international arbitration system on the part of arbitrators about the utility of cross-examination. So there will always be cases where cross-examination is effective, where it's needed, where a witness uh, is, is properly contra uh, contradicted, where something comes out that you wouldn't otherwise have known. This is sacred territory for London QCs. This is our bread and butter cross-examination, and nobody wants to do anything to change it. It's very entrenched in the process, and you will find that uh, tribunals, I find, uh, will therefore rarely constrain the process. The modern approach now, the prevailing approach, is that tribunals sit back and listen. They don't do very much to actually police it, uh, certainly in the, in the international practice. But actually, very often, it's of limited assistance. Very often, it's not done very well. But very often, uh, it's overly cumbersome. Uh, sometimes it's objectionable. It's completely artificial because it puts witnesses into this in the territory where either they stand up to it or they don't. Some people stand up to cross-examination because they are of a, of a strong personality and they can deal with sharp questions. And some people who are perfectly honest, perfectly sincere and truthful are not very good at being questioned and they give a bad impression. So actually what happens in the end is if you've got skilled counsel, you're not necessarily testing truth you are testing resilience, and that's ridiculous. Conceptually, it's not so different to the ancient process of trial by combat. 
Trial by combat was where you used to fight your opponent and the truth would go with whoever won the battle. Until Pope Pius, many centuries ago, the great procedural reformer uh, improved the process by allowing people to get other people to fight for them. It was a great procedural, a great change in civil procedure at the time. Uh, and it meant that whoever would win would be, the, would be the stronger gladiator. But why is it different from what we're doing? Actually, in the end, it's whoever is most resilient and can best handle cross-examination. Of course, tribunals, if they're, if they're well, uh, well experienced, can see through it. They can try to accommodate it, but it's an odd process. It's also actually, from, from counsel's point of view, a process often misunderstood because what counsel use cross-examination for is to make sure that the tribunal have read key documents. So the reason you're cross-examining is to show evidence to the tribunal. I mean, if I put my counsel hat on, there's nothing more worrying than unsupervised reading by the tribunal. Don't know what they've read. Don't know if they've read it in the right way. I want to read the documents to them. So what better way than doing it in cross-examination by showing the documents to the witness? And actually what you tend to get, so often I've seen this, and I'm, I'm sure that there's, there's common experience on, on this call, is a, a counsel will ask stupid questions because all they're doing is showing a document. So what you do is you say to the witness, please turn to bundle three and look at tab four. You see that document? Everybody then reads the document. Actually, at that point, the council has done all they want to do because everybody has read the document. But it's cross-examination, so you need to ask a question. And so the question often is, is that what the document says? And the witness says, yes, that's what it says. And the council says, thank you. I mean, what a ridiculous exercise. And yet we do this at length. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's of no point, but that's what cross-examination seems to have become. So those are, that's a rant about what we do and why we shouldn't do it. It's prevalent throughout our practice uh, in, in many forms of uh, arbitration. So what I just wanna to turn to now are really four areas to focus on, which I think can be focused on as by us as arbitrators in order to improve the system and also by us as counsel in order to maximize the effectiveness of our cases. Because if we understand that these are current concerns on the part of international arbitrators, there's nothing better than having them on board when you fashion your strategy as counsel in order to make sure that the tribunal is not disaffected, that the tribunal doesn't switch off, and that your testimony, your witness testimony, actually is effective. Um, the, 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 the four points are as follows. Although it's contrary to everything that common lawyers would ever uh, um, think, whenever I talk about this topic, by the way, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I know that I'm gonna, there'll be a moment in time where I will be uh, disbarred from the, uh, from the England and Wales bar, or at the very least, uh, I will require a visa to go back to London. But anyway, the, what's contrary to uh, our culture, but actually is very important, is to reconsider, the, firstly, the witness selection process. Because actually what's most helpful for a tribunal is to, is to reposition it as a collaborative process, not a process in the gift of each party exclusively. It should be from the very first procedural meeting onwards, a process of discussion and collaboration between everybody as to who is going to be approached to testify. That is for a number of reasons. It's to try and reduce the strategy that I've spoken about that infects the process. It's to maximize the actual evidence, the breadth and relevance of evidence that the tribunal will receive. And it's also to align the witnesses, rather like we align experts, so that key issues are properly and fairly addressed as between the parties. It's not ships passing in the night. That, that can be done. At a, CM, at a case management conference early on. It can be done in procedural order number one. But there be directions for this. There's nothing in our system as a matter of law or rules that prevents it. It does meet the common lawyer's objection 
that this is a, it is the right of a party in the adversarial system to present the case in the way they want to present it. But contrary to that, as will be familiar to all of you, especially tribunals have their own powers to call witnesses, just they just don't tend to do it. So there should be much more focus on what are you know, the range, what's the range of evidence, uh, and actually what is required of each case um, to, to prove a case. And that means understanding the issues early on, early on to understand um, actually what witnesses might be relevant. The second, take me back to the ICC task force report. What the ICC task force report did very helpfully was to categorize different types of fact witness. So we think of witnesses in a monolithic way. We, we think of them that they come and they give evidence, but actually witnesses do different things. They serve different functions in different cases. There, there are four categories that were identified in the ICC task force. You get firstly, the standard category of providing a true recollection of disputed facts, normally in the absence of documents. All right, so that's, that's one typical purpose of a fact witness, the classic purpose. They are going to provide a recollection on the facts. But secondly, fact witnesses often are presented to narrate or explain contemporaneous documents. That's not actually recollecting facts as such. It's basically explaining other evidence. That's different. Thirdly, some witnesses simply explain background and give general context. They tell the story. That's not the same as recollecting specific facts. Lastly, fourthly, some witnesses provide technical explanations. They act actually like experts, but they're not experts because they're not independent. Actually, that means often they're more expert because they're not independent, really know what they're talking about, but they're not recollecting facts as such, they're giving technical um, addresses. The problem we have at the moment is we put everybody into the first category and pretend it's recollections, but not everybody should be in that category. And the point here is that each category should have its own procedure. If you're going to provide a technical explanation you don't need the same exp, um, uh, procedure as, as if you're in category one and you're providing a true recollection. You don't need to be cross-examined in the same way. You don't need to provide a statement in the same way. Uh, you don't need to be proofed in the same way. You can be treated like an expert and you can give a presentation and then questions could be asked afterwards. There are many different ways one can think creatively of handling witnesses who are not being put forward for actually a particular recollection. So that is a process of actually understanding uh, not only what witnesses are gonna be selected, but what they're gonna do. And then to tailor uh, the actual way in which the process will, will, will proceed. The third point is we obviously need to rethink witness statements. And I think this is something which is, is something us as arbitrators should now be demanding and we're able to do it by actually giving directions of what should and what shouldn't be put into statements. And it's something which us as counsel should be doing anyway, because if we follow good practice, we will make our witness statements more effective. They will be read with better, with more interest. They may actually land a harder punch than otherwise. And this is where I would recommend to you the guidance that's provided in about six pages by the practice direction in the English court that I've mentioned. It's, a, it's actually, it is not something I've ever done before is to say, look, please copy a court practice direction for best practice on this. But this really is, um, it takes into account memory issues in terms of science, and it takes into account the nature of what evidence really is. And it tells you things such as, the witness should not quote at length from any document. The witness shouldn't be commenting on other evidence. The witness shouldn't be provide, providing a statement in a way that has contaminated his or her memory. So stating the blindingly obvious, although now it seems a bit of a shock, why not have a direction that the first draft of a witness statement is drafted by the witness, not by a lawyer? Why not have a direction that actually says the witness statement should include in it an explanation of the steps that went through for the draft, you went through for the drafting of the statement? 
How was it drafted? What documents were shown to the witness uh, in order to um, elicit recollections? Uh, what interviews were done? Of course, you're not going to waive all privilege, but you may have to eat into privilege in order to actually allow everybody a degree of transparency uh, in order to understand the process and then to be able to assess how credible the recollections are. And all that changes actually fundamentally the autopilot that we're on at the moment uh, in terms of presenting this kind of testimony. And the fourth and last point uh, to make is that there actually needs to be active policing of cross-examination. Uh, and this can be done by directions at the beginning or hands-on case management as to what cross-examination is needed, on what areas, not just a free-for-all, uh, what kind of cross-examination, whether it should be done by counsel exclusively, whether it should be done partly by the tribunal, whether it should be done with conferencing witnesses together in, um, at the table. Uh, I think I just finished by saying that some of these points to some practitioners sound novel and to some practitioners they sound dangerous in terms of prejudgment, in terms of bias, uh, in terms of sowing seeds of possible future challenges. But none of it, in my, in my view, requires any change in law or any change in rules None of it is actually dangerous. All of it can be catered for by simply setting out at the beginning of the process in procedural order number one, what the system is going to be. Once that's been signed up to and agreed by the parties, of course it may not be, but if it is, then there can't be any danger at all really. Well, there, there can be some, but there's limited danger. And at that point, the process actually becomes, um, if I may say, and this is strictly confidential between us, it becomes a step dramatically away from the common law system and a step much more towards other systems and other traditions, which actually I've come to the view uh, is, where, is where we should be uh, and that we are wrong collectively to have accepted without any question, essentially the Anglo-US model, uh, which is not actually serving good, the great, uh, our purposes. And I say that even more so in the investor state field. And I'll stop there happy to discuss and happy to be um, contradicted. <laughs> Thank you for a wonderful presentation, Toby. Um, I will ask people to raise their hands if they have questions and will people decide what and whether they want to ask. Let me just start by saying, Toby, that I'm fascinated by what you've done in this topic. I remember your 2010 speech. I followed what the ICC has done. Also, Jose Astigarraba, which there's some uh, symmetry with some things you're, you're doing. Uh, when I uh, read that uh, the ICC guidelines and, um, and found out that the IBA was going to address this with you, I thought this is going to be fabulous. Uh, and I know you're doing the same thing in ITA, so I think I think your your efforts are are well worth it. And I find it there's two reasons I find it especially interesting that you're doing this. First of all, because you're English and you've you've it's from England that we've inherited this technique uh, that you're that you're putting under the microscope. And secondly, because I know you have a backdrop of disagreeing with doing more things to overregulate arbitration. I remember many debates you've had with many people, especially Johnny Veter's debate in LSE uh, with you. And I, it was such a wonderful debate. And the fact that you're doing this is, is, is I think, telling. I think it's, it's insightful. And um, I think my biggest question to you is, and part of it you've answered, is what should we do? Because... Uh, you've mentioned things that arbitrators and parties could do, and I query whether part of this question mark that you're putting in this very imp important process has to bear in mind that we're inherently in dangerous territory, because the moment you try to prove things which don't necessarily leave a, a, a documentary uh, record or, or other types of record, that you're in, in, in a terrain whether, where we've developed, and I say we because we've accepted the Anglo-American uh, technique you're, you're putting under the microscope, we've accepted that this is, this is not perfect, nothing's perfect, but it's pretty good because it gets you better to a result which is better than what we have in other parts of the world. For instance, in my country, interrogation is a completely cryptic, useless, uh, an anachronic uh, uh, procedure that when one coming from a domestic jurisdiction like mine sees what we do in arbitration, it's, it's, it's beautiful because we 
do much better. And the fact that you're questioning this, I think, has to bear in mind that it's inherently an inherently complicated endeavor. Um, yeah. Can I just add, just before I stop and listen to your insight and other people's, I see Carlos Leal, Pablo Gonzalez de Cosillo uh, have raised their hands, but also to add to this discussion that there's very stark views in different parts of the world on this topic. For instance, the French, when I've sat with French arbitrators, they take the, the completely opposite view that you should never trust the witness. They, they're just going to lie. And, and yeah. I remember the first time yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're completely cynical about what a witness will say or do. And quite frankly, we've all seen, uh, we've all seen com uh, te witness testimonies that are complete lies when you're acting as advocate and you know what really happened. Yeah. And how to pass this through to the tribunal is a big challenge. So having said this, I, I will, if you would rather receive more questions, Carlos and Pablo, or what, what's your preference, Toby? I'll, give, I'll just give a few comments. I'm, I'm really keen to hear everybody else, but I'll, I'll just give a, sh a few short comments. I, I, I completely agree with everything you've said. Um, I, I think, I mean, I, and I also completely agree that you do get this very strong, you know, response in France, French arbitrators in particular, who start from the presumption that the witness will be lying, and then you and then you work from that that presumption onwards. I also do take on board very much the point you've made that in in many systems people will look to the arbitration model, saying that it's much better than what we do locally. And I and I, I've seen that, and I've and I've and I've uh, and I've I understand that completely. I think. The point here is that I, I'm not seeking to say, let's start again and scrap everything. There are times where our arbitration model works well. Um, so the example I gave, a true example of the arm deal concluded in, in a swimming pool, you've got no choice but to find evidence of what was discussed and what was agreed in that oral contract. And you're going to have to deal with testif you know, testifying witnesses. Um, but even then, you, the way that we do it at the moment needs to be changed because of the problem of the science of memory. So even if you keep the process, it, it, it is not optimal for on any view, it's not optimal. And that's been recognized even by the London court. It's not optimal. It's got to be um, improved itself on, on its own terms. But I think the bigger point is that that, that category, category of case is, is really perhaps a minority of cases. And in the majority of cases, we are doing something which might might be better than some domestic systems, but it's not the best. It's it, and that's not the best compa comparison. It's not the question. The question shouldn't be, uh, is it better than our local court system? The, the question should be, is it the best that we can do? And actually, it's not. Uh, and in fact, if people are complaining about cost and time in arbitration, which everybody complains about and has been complaining, been complaining about for years, we keep saying it. We say it to each other in conferences, uh, the same people saying the same things. The only thing that changes is the location. We say it's too expensive, it takes too much time, but then we can have to do something about it. And this is one of the key offenders uh, is actually the witness process because that's it's responsible for so much of the cost and the time. Um, so I think um, I, I think that it's it's not it's not a, a situation where we should be, as I say, scrapping everything, but there's I think that could so easily be done uh, and not done by actually jeopardizing the process. But I'll, I'll stop there and, 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 and look forward to hearing other people. Thank you, Toby. Carlos, please. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you very much, Toby. Very, very interesting what you have shared with us. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, I, I was reflecting on, on what you explained. And, and for me, it has always been uh, pretty strange the fact that the attorneys can write down, you know, what the what the witness is going to confirm. And so my question is, what what sort of value is typically given to a witness statement in that way? And I know that this is a technicality, but from an English perspective, and the second question is, if it is common to exclude that uh, that possibility in arbitration cases. Uh, so that the witness is, is actually yeah. only interrogated by the parties. Do you mean? Do you mean? Uh, what, what, so, in, whether in arbitrations you would you would stop a lawyer writing the statement? Right. Not not yeah. to present yeah. the witness only with uh, through the the witness yeah. statement, but rather just asking questions to him or her. I mean, there, there is every, everybody in the common law system, and the, the certainly the English system. Um, there's a kind of um, a pretense all the way through that this is the witness's testimony. And there's an acceptance that as a matter of common practice, lawyers will tend to draft uh, the statement. 
And, and the way that that's got round is, and, and you get this now often stated in witness statements, the witness himself or herself will say in the statement, this statement was drafted by my lawyer, but it was on the basis of my inf information that I have provided, and I confirm that the statement represents my evidence. Kind of standard, standard point. From a scientific point of view, a memory point of view, it's useless. That's completely worthless. And from a probative point of view, an evidence point of view also, it's pretty worthless because how do you know what the lawyer has put in and then the witness says, all right, that sounds good, I'll go with that, as compared to a genuine recollection. So we, we, we have been carrying, and that's why the English court has now said, we've got to stop this and we've got to change the process. And the English court is now saying, instead of putting in that paragraph, you actually have to put in, in a witness statement, how it was drafted, step by step, who did the first draft? How many drafts were there? What process was undertaken to get to those drafts in terms of questions and answers? And what documents or other information was provided to the witness in order for the witness to recollect things? That, that's, the, that's the change. But going to the second part of your question, I have to say, I do not know of any case at the moment that I can think of in arbitration where a tribunal has said, lawyers will not do the first draft. I think tribunals are too scared to say that. But I, but I have had cases. I mean, I, I give you one, one example where I've taken a stand myself. So I just, this is like one war story, but it actually, it marked me, this experience. I came into a case involving, as counsel, uh, some years back, uh, involving very serious allegations of fraud and dishonesty on the part of my client. When I, when, I, when I was instructed, the case had already been prepared. I was brought in at the last minute for the hearing. And all the witness statements had been prepared already. The witness statements, it turned out, had been overly lawyered massively. So when my witness was on the stand being cross-examined, he was cornered completely by opposing counsel because he couldn't defend his witness statement. But he felt he should defend it. He hadn't written it. But because he felt he must be consistent with his written statement, the, the person opposite was able to show he was lying, that he was dishonest. He was destroyed by it. I, I then took him aside after that day of hearing. And I said to him, look, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to say to you, go to a room this evening by yourself without anybody uh, in the room. Sit down with a pen and a paper and just write what actually happened. Just write down in your own words what you think happened, what you recollect. And he did that. And what he produced was not so easy to read. The sentences were not very good. The grammar was not very good, but it was authentic. And it was actually quite different to his formal witness statement. It was an incredible experience. Now, I have to say, it's not a story with a happy ending. It taught me as counsel the problem with the system. It was an unhappy ending because I then applied to try and introduce it to the tribunal. And of course, predictably, the tribunal said too late, not hearing it, uh, not having a second chance, you've had your go. So it's not a story that, has a, that was useful for the case, but it was very useful in terms of understanding that actually what he had done in the end was what should have happened at the first, in the first place. And that would have been authentic and it would have actually been real evidence. Thank you. And, and just to complete, my question was rather in that direction, rather whether the parties could agree, you know, to exclude that that uh, yeah. part of the of the statement and go direct. But you, you responded, yeah. Ali, please. Thank you very much for talking. Pablo. Toby, <clears throat> excellent presentation. Thank you for being with us. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. And I have, um, uh, my question goes, to determine what is the purpose of the witness statement, <clears throat> the, the written witness statement, because uh, is it in one of uh, in one of uh, in uh, experience of mine, I had this uh, the arbitral tribunal and the lawyers uh, that were from the U.S. Well, they were common law trained attorneys. They were saying, okay, the written statement is a direct examination because we have this process. Of Examination is direct examination, then we go with cross-examination and then probably redirect. Uh, 
I had my doubts about this because they were sponsoring. Okay, this is the way we all do it in arbitration. This is the uh, this is the normal way of uh, examining the way. <coughs> Why is it the the written statement, the witness testimony, the written testimony statement, the direct examination? I mean, I, I was I I uh, I, I want to put my my witness there, and I want to do the direct examination so that the arbitral tribunal can see his non-verbal uh, communication or non-verbal uh, gesture so that the, the arbitral tribunal can know that we are telling the truth. So because my witness can uh, put his or her story on the, on the tribunal and just expand anything that probably is not in the witness. So uh, I have my doubts, and also I have my doubts in the interpretation of the IBA rules for the of evidence for international arbitration. I think that the witness statement should not be the direct examination. Of, I, I, I do not think that that should be the custom or the way things are done. Um, because in, in this case, okay, in practice, we put the witness, the witness written statement in the, before the arbitral tribunal. That's We're going to take that as the direct examination. And then we will only go ahead with the cross-examination of probably redirect which will be uh, just focused to the issues of the cross-examination. So uh, this kind of work, this way of doing things for me was like, okay, I think that even that we are trying to be efficient in solving the case, probably this would mean, and this is somehow a question for you, if this can, this custom or this uh, practice can be like, uh, restricting the access of justice of the of the attorneys and the litigators. I was like, okay, that should, I mean, of course, the question is, should the written statement be the direct examination? I'd rather, I'd rather put my witness on stand and show the court that the witness is telling the truth according to his non-verbal sign. And I also would, would prefer if my counterparty is going to put someone on the stand, I would I would like to see the number of signs of the counterparties witness on, di on direct examination. And another thing is, is this written statement subject to the hearsay rule? An out-of-court out declaration is not, uh, I understand that if it is an out-of-court an out declaration, it is not admissible as, uh, as, as evidence. So it's hearsay and therefore it's not admissible in court. And that's why I believe that. So is the function of my last statements. Uh, so is the written statement for probative, uh, it, is its function a probative one, or is it just to show the relevance of the testimony? I'm going to have this written yeah. statement just to show relevance of the testimony. And then we go into the hearing we have direct examination, cross-examination, redirect, but everything before the arbitral tribunal or the court uh, or the state court. So, <laughs> yeah, thank no, you. Thank you. That's um, yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, the short the short answer is that witness statements uh, they they came from England. I'm afraid this is uh, the whole system. I have to apologise on behalf of England. for the whole. System. I am not criticising but... anything. Not, I'm not no, no, criticising anything. Am. <laughs> I am. Just, just, so, try, I'm just trying to learn a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the theory in England, where it came from, is the purpose of a witness statement is to replace direct testimony. That is the purpose, right? So, and and, and in England we call it uh, examination in chief, direct testimony. So the the reason they came about, and I have to say, when, when I trained as a barrister in London. Uh, originally, witness statements were actually quite new in court practice, because before they were introduced as is part of our, one of our civil procedure reforms, we had full scale direct testimony in court. So what would happen is you would have nothing beforehand, nothing at all, not even a summary. Uh, you would call a witness and then you would examine the witness in direct. And that sometimes that took a long time. Sometimes it would take days. And then, and we were trained at bar school to do that because that's where the, the point about no leading questions comes from. 
the whole point about a question not being leading is examination in chief, direct testimony, because you're supposed to ask open questions that doesn't that don't corrupt the witness. And then what would happen is that right at the at the end, immediately at the end of the direct testimony, opposing counsel had to stand up and start cross examining. So it was quite tough that exercise, and then you get redirect afterwards. So the theory of this was it was cumbersome. This process it was it took too long. Uh, it was uh, unfair on some witnesses who were not able to tell their story effectively uh, in response to questions. It was thought. And it was unfair on opposing counsel because there was no time to prepare. You had to stand up and cross-examine, not having heard the evidence before un until that moment. And so everything was felt to be quicker and, and more efficient to replace direct testimony with witness evidence. In response to one of your, your, your other questions, as a matter of English process, the witness statement itself is not actually any evidence that's admissible until the witness stands up in court and adopts it. So before that moment, it's nothing. It becomes evidence once the witness is actually before the judge and signs up and, and confirms the statement, at which point it becomes the direct testimony. Um, the, the, so, so it's different from what I've experienced in some civil law systems where you would have what's called a witness summary, or you'd have like a brief statement of what a witness might be able to cover. Uh, and then you have um, proper direct testimony. The problem with the process is everything that I've spoken about, what it's become. It's become submission. It's become advocacy. But I also completely agree with you in terms of we, the point that we've lost now the moment where you actually can see body language and understand what somebody is like. I completely agree with you. And it's very frustrating if you've got a witness that you want the tribunal to hear because they're really compelling, they're really honest and sincere, and then, and then they're not allowed to. They, they, either all they do is answer questions in cross-examination, which means you don't get a fair view of them, or worse still, which is, you know, which is the, one of the tricks in the common law system. Worse still, the other side don't call them to be cross-examined at all. So they never appear. And so you do get applications, of course, by counsel to the tribunal saying, can my own witness testify, please? And most tribunals, well, their practice varies, but many tribunals will say, no, if, if we've got their testimony in the witness statement. So we are losing something very valuable. Right? I, so in short, I agree. Don Alejandro. Thank you so much, Toby. <clears throat> thank you. And thank you, Toby, for a wonderful uh, speech, presentation. I think that you have really touched on what a lot of us think is, is, is a problem in arbitration. And I was just wondering, as a, uh, a short, uh, perhaps, a suggestion, you mentioned, and it's it, it's absolutely correct that uh, in, uh, in, in many cases, <clears throat> the uh, procedural habits are there. That everything that has to do with the uh, procedure is uh, included in uh, procedural order number one, which is almost automatic. What has been done in the past is repeated in each and every case. <clears throat> And uh, since your suggestions have been uh, mentioned and are very valid, I was just thinking if it would be possible some of these suggestions to start a movement to include them in the uh, PO number one, because we just have very rigid models in most of the, of the orders. But how about if your suggestions are included as a model in, in, in procedural order number one? Would it be possible to say in that, uh, in that order, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the, the, the witness statements should be drafted by the witness, period. And uh, when you say that, then you can very easily realize when you come to analyze the statement, 
if it was written by the by the by the witness or by the lawyer you mentioned some uh, extreme cases and uh, <clears throat> i remember a case which uh, somebody who did not speak the english language and who acknowledged that fact i had written a fantastic written witness statement and when asked if he wrote it he simply said no i didn't write it my lawyer wrote it but i signed it and with my signature i make it mine i mean what is the value of that witness statement now if you should say or you could say in procedural order number one that the statement should not be written by anybody else but the witness you run the risk that it may be obeyed or not, but the arbitrary tribunal is going to know very clearly who wrote that witness statement. And <clears throat> the other suggestions that you made, you could say in the procedural order number one uh, that the, uh, the, the council should identify if the witness is a witness of fact, if it's a witness of background, if it's a witness for interpretation, if he or she is a witness for some technical uh, aspect, uh, you could even agree on that that both parties or or the arbitrary tribunal should uh, have some saying on the type of questions that should be posed to the to to the witness. I mean, I think that many of your suggestions are just fantastic, but if they stay just you know in the in the world of, of theory, uh, that will be fine. But if something could be done as to even, we could say that it, 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 it is falling into the uh, uh, practice, which is to have procedural habits and the habits are included in the procedural orders. Well, if in using that bad habit, some good habits could be included and those would be to include some suggestions, it just may be helpful to the arbitral world. I don't know what you think of that, uh, Toby. Yeah, no, I, I, I have to say again, I completely agree. I mean, this hits the, this hits the absolute heart of it. That, that the heart of it is that um, procedural order number one should not be an automatic document. In any case, it should be tailored to the particular needs of the particular dispute. Uh, and and what, what people tend to do, what arbitrators tend to do all around the world is as soon as they get in a new case, they basically bring up their standard form, procedural order number one, they press print and they send it to the parties and the parties do limited adjustments and that's it. And so we get this standardized model in every case. Nobody has yet taken the time to really understand what the case is about what, what are the particular issues? What's its particular shape? What are its particular needs? So that's a, that's a problem overall. And we, you know, we say arbitration is flexible, but we're not treating it like a flexible system. We're treating it like a rigid system because we apply the same process the whole time. So the flexibility that's inherent in arbitration is simply not being realized at the moment. But on your point about the, my suggestions, I totally agree. Each of the suggestions I've put forward can be put in PO1, absolutely. And they should be. And if they're not, then it becomes difficult because they're theoretical and tribunals will be nervous because parties were not expecting it because it sounds a bit different, but there's nothing wrong in, in, in but it has to be done early. So right at the beginning of the arbitration, um, <clears throat> before people have, have started down a different track, there should be discussion of these points and they should be set out in procedural order number one. Absolutely. I completely agree. Anybody, any more questions? We have six more minutes. Or maybe we can leave uh, Toby because it's very late for you, I understand. No, it's fine. No problem. No? No problem at all. Well, we've taken note of your suggestions. I, I do think your 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 quest is is a very uh, it's worth it. Uh, I do think there's it, it's a big dilemma because even with your suggestions, there's always uh, a chance that we're not we're getting imperfect evidence. But then again, if, how do you get perfect evidence when you have people uh, 
using imperfect processes like the senses, like the memory, what you explained in recording things. Um, I will take you up on the offer to seeing the, the guidelines. I wasn't aware of yes. those. I was aware of the ICC I'll send it. I'll send it to you. Document to yeah. share with everybody else. And again, on, on behalf of the Mexican Bar Association Arbitration Committee and all of us, us here, we very much thank you, Toby, for taking the time of sharing your thoughts and your questions with us. It's been a great, great pleasure. Very, very good to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Toby. Bye bye.